Everything's on. It's on. Good morning, everybody. I was going to say good morning, ladies and gentlemen, but my, my uh, uncle, uh, I'm going to call him Buddy Alfred, he used to say, ladies and gentlemen, bald-headed babies. Yeah. <laughs> he did, yeah, he used to say that. It's good to see everybody. Happy Father's Day, you fathers. I think they gave everybody a little present that was yeah. a father, I think, of some sort. Uh, yeah. Thanks to the Ladies Club. They do some good good stuff for us, the Ladies Club does. We're yeah. glad to have them. Yeah. Glad to have everybody, all these children stuff. And then someone was asking this morning about, or Mike actually was asking about Sunday school. We're going to start it back up, and uh, and if uh, people are interested in doing that, I mean, do that any time, I guess, and start it back up any time. Yeah. They feel uh, ready to do that. I'm sure the kids would like that, and uh, having some crafts and stuff to do. <coughs> That's good. That's all good stuff to do. What what kind of song you got for us this morning? Um, let's do uh, one we've done several times, but 135. I'll not be a stranger. That's a good one. Yes, it is. It's um, a good old Father's Day and uh, 135. Yep, 135. I know a lot of you fathers have gone on and what have you, and uh, hopefully when you when we all get to heaven, we'll not be a stranger. Yeah. Amen. We got a lot of folks over there already, don't we? We sure do, and I was just kind of thinking about that this morning. Once 135, I'll not be a stranger. I'll not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm acquainted with folks over there. They'll be friends there to greet me. They'll be loved. Gates of that city four square through the years, through the tears, they've gone one by one, but they'll wait at the gate until my race is run. I'll not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm acquainted with folks over there. I'll not be a stranger when I get to that city. I'm a home on the street paved with gold. I'll feel right at home there in that beautiful somewhere with my loved ones whose memories I other in heaven. 
though I don't think, uh, I mean, it would be, it'd be wonderful to see our loved ones that's gone on, but I don't think they will mean any more to us than any other Christian, yeah. anybody yeah. else there, because we'll have perfect love then. Right now, you know, Amen. right now we're, uh, you know, we're, we're humans and we're selfish uh, with everything we do. And uh, God did put us in family units, so did he? He did, he did, uh, he sanctified the family. He set it apart uh, from everything else. And, uh, and we are to, to take care of each other, love each other, and, and be good to each other. And that's why he, he gave you, he gave us all people that we're supposed to take care of and people are supposed to take care of us. So it is, it is dedicated by God, sanctified by God. So it is a good thing, but once we get to heaven, our love will be perfected. And we'll love everybody. And, uh, you know, we just need to thank God for all things, don't we? Amen. I'm just talking yeah. with Billy there about that this morning. She mentioned, do we ever give thanks to God for, for prayers that he has answered? And, uh, yeah, yeah we, we definitely do. We don't do that enough, I'm sure. We do, uh, you know, we tend to ask more than we give thanks for, don't we? But we do do that, and we do need to do it more often. We do need to do it uh, on a regular basis because God does answer prayers. He does answer prayers. He don't always answer them exactly the way we think He should because we don't tell God what to do. You know, God, uh, we should ask things according to God's perfect will. And our, and our will is not perfect. We, we ask things amiss sometimes. We don't always ask them the way we should, and we don't always ask for the things that we should. Uh, but God knows what we stand in need of. And you know, people will say, well, what about, a, what about a good Christian person that dies, you know? You know, they might pray to live, but, but yet they die. Yeah. What about that? And you know what I would say to them is, if you're a good Christian and you die, then things are only going to get better and better and better Amen. for you. You know, thanks, that's when things will get good. That's when things will be great. Let's go ahead and uh, speaking of prayer requests, let's take up some prayer requests. Anybody have one this morning? Yeah. Uh, yeah, me and yeah. Pat and the old man Tom, man, he's pretty bad. But he did tell me he was, uh, he was saved. I spoke to him about the Lord and asked him, did he believe in Jesus? You know, that's, that's, that's good. Saved, he, that's a good thing. He said thing. he did. He's yeah. in bad shape. He's an old fella and he's uh, got a lot of problems now. Yeah, we are Terry. Um, a lady at Clean Farm, remember I said she used to be Granny's uh, Sunday school teacher. She's having a really a lot of heart problems. Okay. And we're glad to see CA back today. Yeah, we're glad to have Brother CA back there. Yeah, we're sure. back. Glad to have him. And Lucy Mays, we need to pray for Lucy Mays. Lu Lucy, yeah, Lucy, keep Lucy in your prayers and Nancy, of course, always keep them always in your prayer and Ruth. And yeah, the littles have been here for a couple weeks. We need to keep John and Faye in prayers. We're struggling. William says he uh, needs prayers. Is that what you're saying? You need prayers? Amen. Yes, ma'am. My family, especially my son-in-law. Is he doing better? Not doing, not doing too good? He's not really doing any better. Okay. Well, keep keep uh, Dick McCormick in your prayers, then, for sure. Amen. Yeah, and and uh, Geneva and the rest of her family as well. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. My prayer box and my mother. Yeah. Yeah, we need to keep Billy in the prayers because she has been struggling with arthritis. And uh, as you get older, uh, things do hit you. And I sure got arthritis. And I know that it, uh, it hits me pretty hard sometimes. Yes, sir? Uh, my brother. And his brother's name is Charles, and I said George the last time, but it's Charles. His brother's name is Charles, and he did have one operation. And yeah, what were you going to say? He's got another one. Got, got looking at another one when he gets well enough from this one. Tom Allen and his son, Jim. Okay. Are they doing any better, or are they still? hanging on. Okay. Keep the Allens in your prayers. Yes, ma'am? Me and my family. Elsie and her family. Yes, ma'am? The family of Charles Brooks, I don't know how many know this, as he passed away, so remember his family. Remember his family. Yeah, there's no use in praying for him now. No. No point in praying for him now, but pray for his family. Was it? Charles Griffiths, she said. I don't, know, I don't think I know him right. I, I can't place him if I do. Yes, Tanya? Um, a friend of mine just lost her father, so, or her mother, I'm sorry. Pray for her. Um, that would be the service will be this week. It's Victor Stephan's wife. A lot of people <coughs> probably know Victor. 
Who was that? Victor Steffen's wife. Well, Steffen's a, used to live near us there on the... Popper Thicket? Popper Thicket? No. Different yeah. Steffen? He lived up in Alexander. About everybody in Alexander knows Victor. He kind of likes to get around talking to everybody. Just a friendly, uh, happy-go-lucky guy. I see. Good man. And then I have a friend whose brother is in the hospital. Um, he's got diabetes, but... He also has congestive heart failure. His oxygen level is really bad. He's just got some really hard things going on. I will keep him in your prayers for sure. The whole family and those other requests. Keep Buddy there in your prayers as well. He's still struggling, and uh, and our and our friend uh, Phil Skipper of uh, Truman was asking me about that earlier when he's supposed to come, and that's August 22nd, Sunday on August 22nd. And, and that reminds me, he's still struggling, breathing some too, but doing better, doing better all the time. There's a revival at Georgetown, Kentucky this week. Huh? I think it's tonight. There's going to be a revival in Georgetown, Kentucky. Oh, is it? Georgetown, Kentucky. That sounds uh, I think it's tonight. familiar. You know it, C.A. C.A. goes down there about once a week for the grandkids, I think, don't you? He's going to be there today, I think, through Wednesday. Right yeah. Wednesday through Friday, he is, or Wednesday through no, Sunday? Today through Wednesday. Sunday through Wednesday, okay. Yeah, I like Phil Skipper, he's a good fellow, good man, and does a really good job, I think, preaching. He does. I think he does. Brad, Brad, he's a friend of the church. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Yes, sir? My prayer list, Nancy Cohn, Robbie Griffin. Yeah, keep them all in your prayers, and, and certainly C.A. too himself. He's going through a lot of trouble right now, and uh, going through a rough patch in his life. And uh, just pray that God will, uh, God will heal him and give him a full recovery. Yes. Yeah, Derek? I had a friend of mine pass away last weekend and he was he left his wife and three little kids. Oh boy. Passed away of a heart attack in Barnett family. Yeah. Keep that family in your prayers. They'll have a rough way, won't they? Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. This life is uh this life is hard sometimes. Yes. We we got some hard struggles in this life sometimes. We need to be thankful, you know, when things work out for us as good as they do normally. We need, to, and that's the kind of thing I was saying that we take for granted a lot of times, don't we? Yeah. We just take those things for granted, but uh, you know, things can change in the blink of an eye. And, you know, we have no control over that. We have no control of that at all. Keep Stanley there in your prayers too, Mr. Brewer. He's uh, having some trouble getting his medicines regulated and having some other issues. So keep him and, and his mother in your prayers. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to thank everybody here for the prayers for Buddy Davis and give an update. Buddy caught to Toga and he was very ill. His friend caught it too and he died, but Buddy lived through that. Then he got the infection in his heart and had to go back into the hospital. He's recovered from that and then he had a really severe stroke, which he didn't think he was going to make it, right. but he went home and was doing much better. And I think we ought to thank God for that. Absolutely thank God for answered prayers, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, we need to, uh, you know, we need to not just take all the time, but we need to give sometimes. We definitely do. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Anybody got a silent request on your heart? Because God knows what's on your heart. He knows, he knows your thoughts uh, far off, and He knows the intents of your heart. He knows what you intend. He knows what, when you say something, what you mean by that. God's a great God. He's a perfect God. He knows and does all things and uh, we can't beat him. We can't get him. We, there's nothing better than him. There's nothing greater than God. And just thank, thank the Lord for it. Thank, thank, thank himself. Since you can't thank anybody greater than him, you know, bless God in the name of God. We hope you go ahead and open us some prayer if you would. Precious Father, Lord, we come to you again this morning in the ominous way. You know how just thanking you, Father, for the many mercies and blessings of life you bestow upon us. We know, Lord, it's through you that we live and we move and we have our being. Amen. We know, Lord, that you're the only way to go to heaven. There's yeah. no other way. There's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for this. We pray for all these prayer requests that were mentioned here. You already know our situation, Lord. You already know who you are and what we need. And we just pray that you continue your love and your blessing to us. You're so good to us, Father. You've been so good to us us down through the years. And we just thank you, Father, for all the many mercies and blessings that you bestow upon us. Amen. Again, bless those, Lord, that's uh, sick and suffering today. Bless, bless them, touch us, Father. As I say all the time, Father, you made us. You can fix us. We're just, we're in your hands, Lord. You tell us 
and your word to never leave us nor forsake us, but you go with us always, yeah. even to the end. We pray for our land and country, Lord. We pray you would give them wisdom that they might rule with a righteous judgment and take care of all these problems we have. We pray that you would bless Israel, your land, your country, and your people. We pray for Jerusalem, for Israel. We just pray you continue your love and blessing to us, Lord. Bless our missionaries, bless Brother Phil Skipper, especially. Yeah. Out there uh, doing that revival this week. We just pray for all the missionaries and all your people out there working for you, Lord, in foreign countries and those here in this country who are working for you. Bless all of us, Lord. Just bless us and love us. And give us a good message today. Give Brother Randall a good message today. Bless us, Lord. Give all your preachers and teachers a good message, Lord. And tell us in your words you will share a blessing down on us, Lord, that we couldn't even contain it all. We just hope and pray, Lord, that you would be in our midst today. You bless us, love us, keep us, Father. We know that uh, you're, you're a good God. <coughs> you're a good God, Lord. We just yeah. depend on you for everything. We thank you, Lord, Father. We ask all these family and blessings. And your Son and our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> We are a New Macedonia Baptist Church in Newport, Kentucky. I'm Pastor Randall Baker. I just remind, like to remind you that but we uh, will be still sending in the uh, offerings, uh, gifts, the tithing, whatever we'd like to send in. Still to P.O. Box 151, Alexandria, Kentucky, 41001. And as always, thank you for what you've given and what you will give. And may the Lord richly bless you for that. Uh, as, as I mentioned a week or so ago, uh, Jeremy said that it still has been uh, pretty consistent and uh, been able to pay our bills here and even with a little left over, I think, and, uh, for when we have problems with the church or whatever. So uh, that's a blessing. Yes, sir. Thank God for that. Yes, Thank God for all those perfect, wonderful things that he does for us because we know all the good, great, perfect gifts come down from the Father's lives. That is, of course, Jesus Christ. You got another song? Let's do um, 235, Holy, Holy, Holy. 235. <clears throat> 235. Everybody sing with me now. Holy, holy, holy Lord God.
What are you talking about? <clears throat> yeah, Todd is, can, is welcome to come and sing whenever she wants to. Uh, I always give her that opportunity. She's welcome to come up and sing. Uh, yeah, you can come on if you want. Uh, I was just going to mention in there, it's like cherubim and seraphim, or seraphim and cherubim, and those are angels. And you know, we have something in common with angels. Uh, the angels in heaven I'm speaking of, not that we're all good. That certainly is not one thing we have in common. But you know, we were, we were created to praise God. Just as they were created to praise God. They were created to praise God in heaven and we're created to praise God on earth. And I'm afraid we, we let it down a lot of times, don't we? We don't, we don't do our complete duty always uh, yeah. as, as we should. Come on up, Tanya, and, and sing a song for us. This is a way we can praise God, singing songs of praise to Amen. 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 William really likes this song. It's a really good one. So. <clears throat> Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me. this life. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. I had prepared a uh, sermon, or was in the process of preparing a sermon, and then I remembered that it was Father's Day, so I, uh, I went and got uh, uh, an older sermon that I had done on Father's Day, and I'm going to do that again if that's all right, and uh, I made a couple updates to it, and uh, this will be a good opportunity maybe to get it on video also as well. And some people that haven't seen it or heard it maybe can hear it. And, and hopefully God will bless you with it. God will bless you with it. But you know, the Bible has quite a few things to say about fathers. But 
especially the role of fathers is, is mostly what it gets into now and, and as Father's Day here as we celebrate Father's Day I would just like to uh, uh, put a question before you and that what what makes a good father what makes a good father I mean is it because he's big and strong and can beat up people no but uh, you know as, as I said this before but when my son Derek was young he said uh, you're bigger than Dexter you can beat him up <laughs> Now most kids, uh, you know, most kids, uh, uh, especially sons, they think their fathers are the biggest, strongest guy in the world and can beat up, can do anything. Uh, but you know what happens after they get to be a teenager? <laughs> they don't believe us so much. Well, they think you're probably the dumbest guy they've ever yeah. seen for a while. Sometimes they get out of that. Uh, but that's not how strong a man is. That doesn't make him a good father, how strong he is, you know, how, how, how much weight, weight he can lift or anything like that. But then is it how smart a person is? Is that, is that what makes him a good father? Because there's some very smart people in the world. You know, there's some, uh, uh, there's some rocket scientists, which I guess is what we base on how smart somebody is. There's, uh, uh, there's uh, 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 scientists, there's doctors, you know, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of a lot of people have, are very intelligent, have gone to school for a long, long period of time. Is that what makes them a good doctor? Some fathers and, some, and mothers also, a lot of them, they read all kinds of books and stuff on parenting uh, to, to see what will make them a good parent. Now in the, in the, 19, uh, in the 40s and, and then uh, again in the 50s, was updated throughout that period of time. There was a guy named uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock, and that's not to be confused with the guy from Star Trek. Uh, Mr. Spock. This is Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin Spock. He wrote a book called Baby and Child uh, Care. Where in that book, at first he discouraged people. He discouraged parents from spanking their children. And then he came out and updated the book. And then he completely, completely uh, uh, told people not to do it. He completely said, don't whip your children. Don't spank your children. Be a friend to your child. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. He said, but be a friend of yourself, make him the center of your universe. And, and that's okay too, but he said, don't, don't discipline your children like that. So he influenced a whole generation of people, a couple of generations, and still does, of people in the, in the 60s, and that's of course the hippies, he influenced them not to discipline their children, to be just their friends. So, and you know, that didn't turn out too good. That didn't work too good. You know, when I went to school, when I went to school, but particularly in grade school, the, the principal, you got sent the principal, you get you get swats, and even some teachers gave swats. Yeah. Uh, they had paddles and they gave and they gave uh, swats for kids that misbehaved, for kids that, that would back talk and smart off and stuff. And, and and there wasn't very many kids that did that stuff at that time. Yeah. There wasn't too many that did that. But you know, since that time, violence, especially. In the, in, the, in, well, in, the, in the 40s and the 50s, there wasn't very much, there wasn't very much violence in school. There wasn't very much violence in the world, too much of it anyway. But then when that generation of Spocks, uh, uh, people got up to be, they got up to be teens and they got up to be adult, adults in the, in the late 60s and the early 70s, that doubled. It doubled. I mean, that's more than a coincidence, you know, it doubled. In, uh, in the 1950s, there, wasn't, there was only one mass school shooting in, in America. But by the 1990s, there had been, there had been 42 of them. 42, it gets a lot worse than that. In 2018, there were 113 people killed or injured in school uh, shootings. Now, mass shootings in general in 2020, mass shootings in general, I guess this was worldwide, probably was up to 614. 614, that was... Uh, 446 pe people were killed and 2,515 were injured. So instead of taking the world's advice, instead of taking the world's advice about raising your children, about discipline, or whether you should discipline, we as fathers and parents in general, should do what has been proven for hundreds of years, and that's taking the advice of God. That's taking the advice of God in the Bible on how to raise our children. You know, a lot of parents nowadays will say, I just can't spank my children. I just can't spank them. You know, we hear that. You hear that all the time. You think you're being mean to them. The Bible says in Proverbs 19 and 18, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crime. 
Now, there'll come a time when you won't be able to discipline them anymore. You know, there'll come an age when they won't when it'll be too late to discipline them. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolish, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it from him. And then, and then when, it, when the Bible was giving uh, the requirements for a father to be a bishop, it says in 1 Timothy 3, 4, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. With all gravity. Now, fathers, do you, do, you, do you rule your house well? Or do you just hope that your children will behave? I, mean, I think we do a lot of that just hoping our children behave. Because I guarantee you this, there will come a time when they won't behave. I mean, children are children, and they don't always behave. They test you, and they'll try you. And, you know, at some point it'll be too late for spankings or, or any other kind of discipline. And I just never could understand why, non why Christians, rather, would want to take the non-Christian view of disciplining their children. Because if your children are bad, you don't discipline them then you can't really complain about it. If we do what God tells us, then that'll, that'll make them behave. And reality, in reality, what the, what the Bible talks about is if you don't discipline your children, you're the one that's being disobedient. You're being disobedient to what God tells you. In Genesis 18, 19, I mean 18, uh, 17, beginning in 18, 17, and this is uh, Abraham, and Abraham was a good father. He was a good father. He knew and he understood what he was supposed to do and, and how he was supposed to, to raise his family. The Bible says this in 1817. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So there's some great, great things in there. It says that he will command his children and household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. That's the whole thing of it. That's the whole reason to discipline your children. I'm not telling you to be mean to your children. I'm telling you to be good to them. I'm just telling you to do what the Bible tells you to do. Discipline the way the Bible do, tells them to do. The Bible says that a good father runs his children and his household according to the way of the Lord. Now, I've talked about this before, but there's two different kinds of fathers. We know that. And, and TV has shown us, has shown us, uh, how, you know, has portrayed how they, how they are down through the years. And, and as I said, we've talked about this before. I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles while, we're, while I'm talking about this. Turn to uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 8, 1 Timothy 5, 8. In the 1950s and the in the early, early parts of 1960, the fathers were strong, were a strong, smart, uh, they were smart, uh, strong, manly leaders of their household. Like, for instance, in the, in, the, in the show Father Knows Best, you know, he was, uh, he was kind to his wife. He was good, but firm with his children to his kids. And that's, that's probably the way you suppose should be. They had values. They had morals. They did good things. They gave good advice, and they didn't run away from the responsibilities. Of course, everybody knows Leave it to Beaver. If you've got me TV, you can watch that over and over and over again if you want to. But Ward Cleaver, he was a smart, strong uh, father figure, and he was in charge of his household disciplining his children. And the Bible says this in Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. You think you don't spank your children because you love them, but the Bible says just the opposite. If you love them, you do discipline them. You do chasten them. You don't just leave it up uh, to whatever happens. TV dads uh, were influenced at that time. They were influenced. Real life dads were influenced by TV dads. And uh, in the 70s, things started to change, though. The father's role was downplayed, and it became a joke. It became a joke. The father's, father's role in the family was a joke. He was weak. He was the weak one in the family. And the, and the mother was strong, and that was supposed to be funny in somehow. She was the one in charge of, the fam of everything in the family. And the, and the feminist movie, uh, movement, of course, had a lot to do with that. But the father became a dumbed down, weakened version of what a dad should be. I know everybody has watched Tim Taylor of Home Improvement. So, you know, he's a lovable character. You know, he's like, you know, a likable character. But, he, you know, he was a bumbling kind of idiot kind of guy. And, a, 
and doing and saying dumb things, and his wife would always have to correct what he tells the children and, and uh, you know, anything that he would say. King of Queens, of course, he's not a father, but he's the husband. He's a childish, immature kind of guy, and uh, his wife has to correct him all the time. And then her father on the show was just a bumbling idiot kind of a guy. Everybody loves Raymond. I don't know if everybody here loves Raymond, but I'm sure you've all seen the show. And Raymond was childish and selfish and incompetent kind of guy. And his wife was a smart, capable, and in charge one in household. And don't get me wrong here, I'm not saying anything against women, you know. Uh, they are very smart women. They are very capable women. Absolutely. But the father, he was, a, he was a bumbling, goofy guy. And, and, uh, and Disney even took that a step farther. If you watch, that sh if you watch the Disney shows about uh, the family, they took it even farther. The, the father's always a goofy kind of guy, doesn't know what's going on. The mother sometimes is as well. She doesn't know what's going on either. And the kids... They said the kids are the smart ones. The kids are the capable ones. They're the kids are the ones that are in charge. And they don't need any adult supervision or parental supervision. But back to what a father should be. What should a father do? What should he do for his family? How should he, how should he provide for his family? What should he do for his family? In 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says this, talking about it. It says, but if any provide not for his own and uh, Especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith, faith, and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unbeliever. So if he don't provide for his family, he's worse. He's worse than an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. He's as bad as you can get. In Second Thessalonians three ten, it says, "For even when we were with you, this we command you that if any would not work, neither should he eat." So you know, man's supposed to work. He's supposed to work, and I'm not. Certainly not getting into whether a woman should or not, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Go ahead and turn over your Bibles to Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 25. I know in this world today, you know, things are different than they used to be. It, it's hard to make it on one person's salary. But this happened in the, in the world, uh, during World War II, uh, while, the, while the most young men were, and, and middle-aged men were away at war, when they were away fight, fighting the war, the factory jobs, they still needed to be filled. They still needed to, to, to the ammo for the fighting, the guns, the tanks, everything. All the things had to be made. And, and everything that for life that went on all through that time, it still needed to be done. It still needed to be made. It still needed to be manufactured. So there was a campaign that was started to get the woman out of the housewife setting and into the factories. And a fictional character was born. It was Rosie the Riveter. I'm sure some of you uh, remember that. They were, you know, there were radio uh, forecasts about her. They were made to encourage women. They were made to encourage women to go work outside the home. There were posters made, and they were put everywhere. And, and, and I don't know if you have seen her or not, but she was uh, in a, a blue-collar uh, work shirt and had a bandana tied around her head. She had her muscle made like this, saying that we can do it. And it was for a worthy thing. It was a needful thing at the time. It needed to be done. Well, you know, it changed into a campaign to, to empower women to leave the house, housewife stereotype and to never look back or never go back to it. And it's gone on now for women uh, uh, that, uh, that say they're no different from men. And don't, get me, don't ever get me wrong here. I'm not saying that women are any less than men in any way, in any form, or any shape, or about anything. I'm not saying that. They are not. Everybody is just as important as everybody else. I'm just saying that they're different. I don't know who can not look at a man and woman and say there's any difference between them. There's lots of difference in, in the way they emotionally, physically, everything is different. But how should a godly man, how should a godly man then treat his wife? In Ephesians 5.25, Ephesians 5.25 says this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a big responsibility put on there. Uh, just look over here in uh, Ephesians 6, 4. In Ephesians 6, 4. Jesus Christ gave his life for the church. He gave his life for the church. And fathers, husbands, they should be willing to give their lives, if necessary, to protect their wife and their children, their household, their family. They should do that. The Bible says the wife should submit to the husband as unto the Lord. The children should obey both the father and the mother. They should obey both the father and the mother. Because the Bible says that it's right in the eyes of the Lord. We ought to be willing to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. We ought to always be willing to, you know, depending on whether it goes against what we believe, what we think it should be, or what the world has taught us to believe, we should still, we should still do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. 
You know, even if it's hard to do, and sometimes it's very difficult to do in this world, but we should do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. A good father should chasten the children, but he should love and be kind to his children. You know, there's a good balance. There's a balance in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So don't browbeat your children. We're not to browbeat them. We're not to beat them down. We're not to, uh, we're not to uh, just criticize everything their children do. But we are to lift them up. We're to encourage them. We're to encourage them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, marriage and having a family, that's a big thing. It should never be taken lightly. It should be taken very seriously. Because you know what? We live in a throwaway kind of world. We live in a throwaway world. You know, we got microwaves, uh, microwave dinners, uh, TV dinners, and all, all that kind of stuff. We got paper plates and paper cups and paper uh, forks and spoons, uh, called flatware or something, I guess. You know, and when you're not needing them, you just, you just throw them away. You, know, you just throw away, and I'm afraid that marriage has become like that with a lot of people. Relationships and marriage have become that way. You know, people just figure, well, we'll get married, and if, uh, you know, if we, don't, if we don't work out, we'll just get a divorce. Amen. You know, people, people say that, and they do that stuff. Sometimes it's hard to make a relationship. It's hard to work things out. It's hard to get things going. Uh, you know, and this was, this was a while back that I saw this statistic, but about 50% of the marriages, and I think this is in America, about 50% of the marriages end in divorce. And that's not just with non-Christians, that's with Christians as well. It's about the same thing with Christians and non-Christians. I think in the world, why there's about 100 divorces an hour. That's a lot. That's a whole bunch. Uh, the Apostle Peter in the Bible advises husbands, and says to dwell with them, speaking of wives, to dwell with them, giving honor unto the wife, giving honor unto the wife. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Hebrews 12, 5. Hebrews 12, 5. And we ask fathers, we should take our cue from someone who wrote the book on parenting. And I'm not talking about that evil uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock. I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about our Father God, who inspired the Bible, who told us how we should do that, who has given us every, as we said earlier, every good and perfect gift has come down from God, has come down from the Father of lives. You know what? God promises to give us life and to give us it more abundantly. He has promised that stuff to us. But you know what He don't do? He don't coddle us. He don't treat us like we're little babies and, and we can't and we can't be disciplined or we can't and we can't take any kind of criticism or anything. Because he is going to, he is going to uh, ch chasten us. He's going to rebuke and chasten us. And rebuke is, you know, rebuke is saying, hey, you're doing things wrong here. You need to do things right. You need to do things the right way. And chasten is discipline. He does discipline us. He don't turn us over his knee. But he does discipline us. He does, uh, he does take things from us. Uh, you know, maybe sicknesses even are, are disciplines. I don't know. I don't know exactly what, you know, I don't know the mind of God. But he does promise to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. And I believe him. I believe that he will. That he will. We're not, we're not, he's not going to protect us from every word anybody says against us, from every insult that people give us. He's not going to protect you from that stuff. You know, sometimes we just got to grow up. But you know, after we're saved, we do have that promise of eternal life. He does give you that promise. And that's a pretty darn good promise. I don't know of anything else that could compare to that. But still yet, He don't give us free reign to sin. He don't give us free reign to do whatever we want to do. He don't, we, can't, we can't go out and live like the devil. No. We're, not allowed, we're not supposed to do that. No. He still expects us to keep our vessel clean. He still expects us to do that. It's hard to do, I know that. He expects us to keep it and have a good testimony. In Romans 6, 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we're Christian, we should try to live like Christians. We'll fail. We'll stumble. And we'll fall. We've got to pick ourselves back up, don't we? We've got to pick ourselves back up. We've got to ask forgiveness for it. And the Bible says that He's just and righteous to forgive us, to forgive us and to cleanse, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So He is faithful to do that. You know, if we're faithful enough to just say, hey, I, you know, I've messed up here. Please forgive me for this. 
He's faithful to do that. He's faithful to forgive us. He's faithful uh, to cleanse us from that unrighteousness. You know, we, we have a hard time forgiving people for certain things. You know, I know I do. I have in the past. We do. But God forgives us of our sins. You know, he, there's, he, he removes them as far as the east is from the west. And uh, I don't think it's Bible, but somebody says that neither the twain shall meet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's uh, 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 God is a great God. And He's able to do all things. He's able to forgive you that. Forgive you for things. Uh, Romans 6, 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, but you should obey it in the, that you should obey in the lust thereof. So we're not to let sin overtake us. We're not to let lust overtake us. We're not to let that rain in your body. You're not to let that... I mean, you can't help having a thought, a bad thought or something sometimes, but you don't have to dwell on it. Yeah. You don't have, to, you don't have to, to keep at it. You can ask for forgiveness for it, and you can try to get away from doing things that you shouldn't do. We should all strive to be better servants to God. We should all strive to do that. In Hebrews chapter 12, is that what I had you turn to? Yeah. Chapter 12, 5, it says this. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Amen. If you're a child of God, you're going to get chastened. Because, because you're going to sin. You're going to still do things wrong. Some people are, are, are better at not sinning than others. Some, some people, you know, give in to sin or yield to temptation a lot easier than others do. And some are able to uh, get, get away from it. You know, I, there's some of the old people that just don't look like the butter would melt in the mouth. You know, and, uh, and they were good, good people, great, great people. And, uh, you know, and then you have people that go out and, and, and do terrible things. But that don't mean they're any less saved than somebody that doesn't, doesn't do anything. What you will do is you will lose rewards. You will lose uh, the things that God would give you. You will lose blessings. And, and I mean, I, I pointed this out before, but, but it says that the uh, effectual prayers of a, the fervent effectual prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So, you know, if we want our, if we want our uh, uh, prayers answered, then we need to do our part, and that's at least make an effort to be uh, to be what God would have us to be what, to, to be uh, not let sin and, and lust reign in our lives if you're saved and if you sin and we all sin you will be punished by God just as he tells us the fathers to punish him, our children it says that he will punish us but he also tells us to be good. He tells us to be good to our children, to our families. Luke eleven three says, If ye be been being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? If you can do some good things to your family and you can give good gifts, think of what God can give to you. Think about what God can give you just, just, just for asking him, just for, for doing what he would have you to do. You know, if we use God for an example in our lives, we can't go wrong. We can't do wrong if we use him uh, as our example. God is our creator. He saw that we were lost. He saw that we were going, that we were bound for an eternity in the lake of fire. He saw that. He understood that. So he sent his only son to die for us. And you know, that was the greatest gift. That was the greatest gift, the greatest sacrifice that was ever given to mankind or ever will be. That's just the love of the Father. That's the love of the Father. If we, if we as fathers base our everything we do on God the Father, then we'll, we'll, be, we'll do well. You know what? This is how much He loved us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. That's how much God loves you. That's how much, you, that's how much your Father God loves you. That's how much. So as fathers, as fathers here on earth, we need to do this. Use Father God as an example uh, of what to follow and, and what we should be. And, and we need to be the head of the family, the spiritual leader, the provider as God designated. We need to do those things. We need to love our wives and our children as God said. We need to lay down our lives if necessary. 
We need to do that if necessary. We need to be kind to our family and show the love of God. We need to do that to all, all, even our Christian families, we need to do that. We need to be a good, godly example to all. If you're a father and you're not saved, you need to get saved. Amen. You need to get saved, then you need to get your family in church and get them saved. You need to get the rest of the family saved because the father is the watchman of the family. He's a watchman and your blood is required. Their blood is required at your hands. So you need to, you need to do your responsibility. You need to keep it. Go ahead and turn over your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you don't teach your children the godly way, the world will. The world through TV, movies, and music, it will be glad to teach you uh, the evil way to do things. Now the father has a big responsibility to the family, as the mother does also. There's a big responsibility that raises the family, but along with great responsibility comes great satisfaction. If you raise your children in the admonition of the Lord, the nurturing of the Lord, if you do that, then you can enjoy watching them grow up and serve God as you should. But if you're not saved yourself, you can't teach your children how to worship God. So the first thing first is you need to get saved. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. And then teach your children by example, by taking them to church, by leading, by being a follower of Christ. If your children are already grown, if your children are already grown and, you, and you've not been saved and they haven't been saved, it's never too late. Amen. Not while you're alive on this earth, not while you're all breathing, not while you're breathing, not while your children are breathing. It's not too late. Lead by example, as the Apostle Paul said, be followers of me also, as even as I also am of Christ. That's what we do need to do as fathers. That's how you can make a, an impact. That's how you can, uh, that you can uh, uh, lead your children is by doing what God would have you to do. By being a follower of Christ, by being, uh, understanding what God the Father would have you to do. But if, you were, if you're not saved, what you need to do to be saved is just follow this simple, simple formula that it gives you here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, when it says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. So if you'll confess, if you'll just admit that Jesus is Lord, if you'll look at that word there in the Bible where it says Lord, you'll notice that it's a capital L. That means he's the Lord of Lords. A Lord can just be somebody that owns a house. Can be, that can be the Lord of the house. But with a capital L here, when, when there's a title for Jesus Christ or God, it's always with a capital letter because he's above everything else. That's a name that's above all other names. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. If you just confess him, if you'll just confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, the Bible says thou shalt be saved. Amen. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... And this is your own heart. You've got to believe in your own heart. For with the heart uh, a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto righteousness. Amen. And it says here in 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're a sinner, you can pray to God all day long and He's going to hear that. But that's the one, word, that's the one prayer He will hear. If you pray to Him for Him to save you, that is the sinner's prayer. That is the prayer that God will hear. And if you believe it, like He said, if you believe in your heart that God, that He is Son of God, that He is Lord of all things, He's the boss of everything, He's the master of your life. If you can believe that in your heart and you can confess it to Him, if you can tell Him that, you can call him, if you can call on Him and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm bound for hell. Please save me. The Bible says thou shalt be saved. Amen. That's pretty easy, folks. That's pretty easy. He ain't, he ain't expecting you to do no massively great thing to be saved. And we're always going to fail as humans. We're always going to fail. Oh, wretched man that I am, the Apostle Paul said. And, and look at Paul, what a great Christian he was. What tremendous amount of faith he had. What great things that he did for God. And he still considered himself... An old wretched man. Amen. You know how are we going to be compared to the Apostle Paul? I think I think Brother Dave has said before. I hate to be standing behind Paul when they hand out the rewards and stuff in, in heaven. Because what are we compared? Yeah, and we don't have to compare him ourselves to anyone. All we got to do is just do what the Bible tells us, Amen. and that is to confess him, Lord, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. 
and then call on him. That's all the Bible says. And we have to do it thou shalt be saved. If you haven't done that, folks, I urge you to do that. I urge you to do that before it's too late. As I said earlier, it's never too late as long as you're alive. Once you leave this folks, this place, though, folks, it, it's set in stone then. It's over then. You know, uh, and this is this is a paraphrase, but as a tree falls there, so shall it dry. So there ain't no changing it, you know, there ain't no changing it then. So just 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 do it while you're while you're able, while you're cognitive, while you know what's going on, while you're alive, while you have breath in your body. Just tell him you believe who he is. Just tell him you believe that God uh, that God raised him from the dead, and he shall be saved. Close us in prayer, will you? Gracious Father, Lord, we again come to you thanking you, Lord, for this day. Thanking you for the message we heard. Thanking you, Father, that you are our Heavenly Father and that you're there for us. Man. And, and all the things that we do and say, Lord, you're yeah. there for us. We just uh, hope now that you will dismiss us in your love and in your fear. Bring us back on the appointed time. Give us safe passion. We'll travel along. Amen. Love us and keep us. For all this favor and blessed we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 See you next week.